In this lecture, I'm going to give some uh, background information on eigenmodes in partial differential equations, what they are physically, and how we can compute them using a numerical method called the shooting method. And I'll try to make clear where that name comes from uh, when I introduce it. So let's begin with a physical example, which is a wave equation. So like waves on a vibrating string, like a violin string, uh, or a phone cord if you shake it up and down real hard, or many, many other vibrating objects. Um, strings like that have periodic motions, motions that repeat in time and in which the shape of the string that's vibrating uh, retains its form, its shape, as the oscillation progresses. So here's an example of that. Um, here is the lowest vibrational mode of a string. And um, I can change the number of ups and downs, uh, the number of uh, vibrating segments. And this is the next higher mode of this vibrating string, and so forth. And you can see that in each one of these modes, the um, shape, if you, if you like, of the uh, vibrating mode is retained. The only thing that's oscillating in time is the amplitude, the, the strength of it, the height of it is oscillating uh, sinusoidally. So how can we describe that mathematically? Well, we begin with the wave equation, uh, which is a partial differential equation describing vibrations of a string under tension. Here h is the uh, transverse displacement of the string, the height if you want, t is time, x is position along the string, k is the spring constant of the string, the stiffness of it, how easy it is to uh, extend in length, which happens a little bit when the string swings sideways, it has to get a little longer, and m is the mass per unit length of the string. So this equation has many solutions, it's a partial differential equation, uh, in time and space. To find these modes, these um, oscillating shapes that stay the same in time and vary periodically in time, we make a guess about the form of the solution. Instead of being a general function of two variables, we imagine that it is a, an oscillation in time, this cosine, times a shape which stays the same, which doesn't depend on time. This is a guess, okay? Um, but it's a good guess. So we insert that into the equation here, and the cosine gets two time derivatives taken of it, and the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and the der derivative of sine is cosine, and each derivative pulls out a factor of omega when you do the chain rule, so that on the left what you wind up with is minus m omega squared times the function f times the cosine, and on the right, the space derivative doesn't touch the cosine, it only touches the f, and so on the right, what you get is k times f double prime of x times the cosine. So the cosine term is the same on both sides, and I've canceled it out, and that then gives me an ordinary differential equation for f, the shape function. So we've taken a partial differential equation, made a guess, and turned it into an ordinary differential equation, which is a lot easier to solve. The boundary conditions for this um, ODE are that the, that the displacement h is zero at the ends of the string. Remember, it's fixed here and fixed there. It can't go up and down. And so the boundary condition on f is that it should be zero on one end and on the other end. So now we have this ODE for f, um, and we can, get a, we can guess an answer to that as well. Um, again, based on sines and cosines, that is, if you remember that the derivative of sine is cosine and the derivative of cosine is negative sine, if you put a sine in here, you'll take two derivatives and you'll get minus sine times the square of whatever coefficient is inside. So if I move the k over here and make this m omega squared over k and call that thing epsilon squared, then the function sine epsilon x will solve this equation. And it satisfies the left-hand boundary condition, that is, f at x equals zero is zero, because the sine vanishes there. 
but it doesn't necessarily vanish at x equals 1, which is the far end of the string. For that to happen, the sign has to swing through an integer number of ups and downs. And that means that epsilon times 1 has to be, for example, pi, or 2 pi, or 3 pi, so that the sign swings through 1, or 2, or 3 swings from one end of the string to the other. And so epsilon has to be pi times n, where n is 1 or 2 or 3 or what have you. There are only special values of this guess which correspond to special values of these frequency, the, the time frequency of the, of the vibrating string. So there is a special set of vibrational mode frequencies of the string, which is given by this expression here. So we can see that visually if we imagine taking that function sine of epsilon times x and just varying epsilon, and I've set up a little Mathematica panel called Manipulate to do that, and the way it works is manipulate something, typically a plot, so that you can see it um, with a certain parameter that you're varying over some range with a slider. And it's also got this little plus minus thing here which shows you the number you've got it slid to and also gives you a movie player so that you can just ramp the coefficient over its range and then when it gets to the end it starts over again. And so what you can see is that as I change epsilon, okay, the function curves faster and faster and at a very special value of epsilon, which is pi, you can see right there, it goes through exactly one half period. And then it, as you increase epsilon, it, it curls over faster and faster, and eventually when you get up to 2 pi, 6.28, okay, then the function goes through a whole period, right, because sine of 2 pi times 1 would also be 0. And likewise, 3 pi, which is, you know, 9 point something, um, the function uh, vanishes again at the far end, and so there's this discrete set of values of epsilon for which the sine function satisfies the far boundary condition, where the string is supposed to not be moving up and down. Now consider a slightly different problem in which the string has a spring constant k that instead of being a constant varies along the length of the string. So the function k, the, the, what used to be a constant k is now k of x and it's equal to some constant k times some g of x and g of x varies and so the spring constant in this example is very big in the middle, in other words the string is very stiff to being stretched and very floppy on the two ends. Uh, the wave equation in this case is slightly different. It takes a form like this. Um, but we can still make the same procedure of trying to guess that there are shapes of the string modes, the fancy word for it is eigenmodes, of the string motion that oscillate in time with some cosine and have a fixed shape. And so we make this very same guess, plug into now this different wave equation, and so on the left, again, the cosine gets hit twice by the time derivative and gives back minus cosine times omega squared, and the f is not touched. And on the right, well, the cosine goes through these space derivatives because it doesn't depend on space, but the f gets taken derivatives here and there, and the k, because it depends on x, also gets a derivative taken of it. And when the dust settles from all that, you get an equation that looks like this. With the same definition uh, as before for epsilon, that is, epsilon is um, m omega squared over k. Epsilon squared is. Now this equation with that function g that we defined up here, which is telling the, the way that the spring constant varies, uh, is a little too complicated to solve for f analytically. But we can find solutions of f for any given epsilon uh, numerically, and we can adjust the value of epsilon so that those solutions satisfy the boundary condition.
on the far end. And this is the shooting method. So the idea is we solve this, which should be a boundary value problem in which f is zero on both ends. We solve it as an initial value problem where we take f of zero equal to zero on the left end and also the first derivative equals to one. That amounts to saying we're going to launch the, the, the f sort of like a cannon that you fire on one end and what you want it to do is to land on the boundary condition on the far side. So to explore that we set up another manipulate panel and the way this one works is we solve the differential equation as an initial value problem. We save the solution in ants. We use that to make a plot of the function here I've just, instead of defining a function which is equal to that solution, I just take f of x and substitute by the answer right here. And you'll notice that I've defined answer to be the first and only solution of the ND solve. So this compactly gets the solution that is calculated numerically here, plots it as a function of x from 0 to 1, um, and then that whole thing is the thing that is being manipulated by manipulate and here is the instructions to manipulate saying please make me a slider for epsilon that goes from 0 to 10. Okay, so how does that work? Well, just fine. As I increase epsilon, you see that the function curls over more and more and that for a special value of epsilon of about 1.42 now I get a mode of the string which is satisfying the far boundary condition. And the mode shape looks very different from a sinusoid now because the string is really stiff in the middle and hard to stretch that part tends to be flat as the mode goes up and down in time um, because any place that the string is curved it's longer to go around the corner of the of the curved region. So it's reasonable that if you stiffen the string in the middle you'll get a flat spot uh, in the oscillating mode. And we can increase epsilon a little more and see another such mode and yet another mode. And these are the first three oscillating modes of this funny string which is stiff in the middle. Now if we want to know a little more precisely what the value of epsilon is that satisfies the boundary condition than just trying to tune the slider so that that line hits over on the far end at zero, we can use find root. And the way that works is we define a function which returns the value of the solution at the far end. So here with this ND solve we calculate the solution. Here we substitute f of 1 by that solution and what that will do is return the value of the function not just anywhere but at the far end. And the whole thing is a function of epsilon which is sitting here as a parameter inside of the numerical solution of the differential equation. So this function fn then is a function of epsilon which returns the value at the far end. Now I've defined this function in a funny way with this little thing that says numeric q here with a question mark. And what that does is a little bit technical but basically it's an instruction to Mathematica that this function should be regarded as a kind of a black box as having only numerical arguments and that Mathematica shouldn't try to do things like take derivatives of this function or things like that. And that turns out to be important for using it in conjunction with find root. So I've got my function g defined above. I've got my um, I have my numerical solution uh, written out here. I can define this function now. I can test evaluating it and I get um, a sensibly behaving function. And now from my slider example up here I know that the first uh, eigen mode has an epsilon of about 1.4 
And so I can make that as an initial guess here. And then it polishes up and gives me a very nice, uh, precise value for epsilon. Another example of a physical situation in which a function keeps its shape as it evolves in time arises in the study of time-dependent heat flow. So imagine that you have a rod, initially hot, and clamped between um, two uh, heat sinks and insulated along its length. And so what happens is the rod is initially uniformly hot in the middle, and then um, heat will flow out of the rod into the cold heat sinks. And so you might expect that heat will um, flow out more quickly from the ends, and so the temperature will drop more quickly on the ends and, and more slowly in the middle. It turns out this problem is one that can be solved analytically, and you'll, you'll see this solution in heat transfer class if you haven't seen it yet. And I have built a little manipulate panel to explore how the temperature evolves in time as this rod cools from the ends. And what I'm manipulating is a plot of this exact solution written as a sum, um, which is beyond what I want to tell you about right now. So the manipulate panel uh, manipulates the time in the plot uh, from basically 0 up to 2. And so if I slide the slider, you can see how this rod indeed does cool quite quickly at the ends. The temperature drops rapidly there, or slowly in the middle. But another thing that you notice is that as time goes on, uh, pretty soon the shape of the temperature profile seems to be the same, just getting weaker. It's in fact, looks like a sinusoid. It looks like one half of a sine wiggle, and it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and keeps going down. So um, we'd like to see analytically how that happens. Here is the heat transfer equation. Um, C sub V is the heat capacity of the rod per unit length. This is the time derivative of the local temperature along the rod. Kt is the heat transfer coefficient, um, and this is the second derivative of the um, temperature along the rod with respect to space. So this looks a lot like the wave equation, except that you don't have two time derivatives over here. And what we're seeing in the little movie, if you like, is what looks like maybe it's an exponential decay of the profile after a while. So to understand analytically how that comes about, um, we look at the heat transfer equation and um, make a guess similar to what we did in the case of the wave equation, that perhaps the solution can be thought of as a shape that doesn't vary in time except for decaying in amplitude exponentially, because that decay there looked maybe like it was exponential. Um, so if you plug this into the heat transfer equation, on the left, the time derivative hits the e to the minus alpha t and pulls down a factor of alpha, but doesn't touch the f. And on the right, the space derivatives hit the f, but they don't touch the uh, decaying amplitude factor. So on both sides, you have an e to the minus alpha t, which I've canceled out here. And on the left, you have a minus alpha from that time derivative times the f. And on the right, the f gets two space derivatives taken of it, so you get a form like that, which is very similar to what we got when we analyzed the wave equation um, for shape of waves on a string. We got basically an equation like this with just some of the names changed. If you pull uh, kappa t over here and define that to be epsilon squared, in fact, it's exactly the equation we got for the, for the eigenmodes of a string. And that motivates a guess, just as before, of sine epsilon x for the very same reason, because it's the same equation. Uh, again, the boundary conditions here are that f is 0 on both sides. And this uh, guess here only satisfies the left-hand boundary um, automatically. That is, sine of x equals 0 is 0 always. But on the right-hand side, only special values of epsilon will work. And those special values, as before, are pi times n. Uh, which means that each one of these um, characteristic shapes, of which the sign uh, that we were looking at is only the lowest one, has their own exponential decay constant. In other words, once you know the epsilon, you know the alpha because of this relationship here. 
and the decay time for those different modes of shape of temperature, you might say, that preserve themselves as they decay, uh, get faster decay as n goes up uh, quite quickly, which is why only the lowest of those, n equals 1, the sign with only one wiggle on it, is the one that survives this shape here.